Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Louisa. If you're new, feel free to subscribe. And if you're coming back, welcome back. So today's video is probably going to be a long one. I wrote out a whole bunch of notes and there is like a ton, a ton of notes. I'm not even a hundred percent sure of what to call this video. I might change my mind by the time it comes to actually naming it uh, for upload. But at this point in time, the general subject uh, that we're going to be discussing today is art, uh, which I do have a degree in already. So I have a degree in contemporary art, which will become relevant. <laughs> we're also going to be talking about aliens, which is not something that I have covered on this channel before. It was never really a subject that I was interested in, um, but it is something that is becoming more and more pressing to talk about. And the other topic for today is satanic ritual in popular culture and witchcraft in popular culture. As I mentioned before, I have a degree in contemporary art, which is basically the really um, woke, <laughs> wanky kind of art. Let's just say that I have gone back to uni to uh, study something a little bit more conducive to a career. <laughs> and for those of you who are new to the channel, my previous YouTube channel, which I had for uh, like a couple of years, that was a channel which taught people witchcraft. So what I'm going to be talking about today is subjects that I am uniquely qualified to talk about because of my past. But in case you're wondering, God delivered me from witchcraft, from familiar spirits, from divination, all of that kind of stuff. And as such, I am now bought and paid for with the blood of Jesus, which means that I am a bond servant of God, as well as an adopted child of God. So that's essentially what happens when you go through the born again process. When you are born of spirit, you cease to be dead in trespasses and sins, and instead you are given a whole new life. But with that whole new life comes service. And you do this service out of love to God. So what exactly does that look like? Well, essentially what it means is my money and my time and various other things like that, they don't belong to me anymore. They are at the disposal of God. I am now the steward of those resources. But if God sends me somewhere or if he wants me to spend money on a particular thing or if he wants me to save money, then that is what I do. And that is essentially the principle of walking by faith and not by sight. So I don't necessarily plan a lot of what I do, except for things like, you know, university, planning my assignments, stuff like that. It's not as though I spend my entire life just being whimsical. <laughs> so about a month ago, I was working on the last of my assignments. I was getting ready for my exams and things like that with university. And um, I knew I had one week. I get one week off in between classes. Christmas and New Year, I get a little bit longer, but for the rest of the year, I have a total of about three weeks dispersed uh, throughout the rest of the year. So spring, autumn, winter. Also for context, uh, I live in Tasmania, which is the island state at the south of Australia. So I am one of the most southern places in the world, uh, which means that winter is in the middle of June. As I'm filming this, it's basically the winter solstice. And it's also the last day scheduled for a particular event, which is currently going on in Hobart. Hobart is the capital city of Tasmania and it's right at the south. 
So because I'm in the north, I don't really get to visit Hobart very much. It's not a place that's really on my radar most of the time. So I was getting ready for my exams and I had the word from God saying, I need you to go to Hobart. And so I had various different signs um, and nudges and specific bits of knowledge is kind of hard to explain. But essentially he said that I needed to be in Hobart for Wednesday the 16th of June. So this was right in the middle of my only week off. And I wasn't really sure what it was that I was going to Hobart for. Uh, I kind of had this general mission of talking to someone and seeing something, but I wasn't really sure. So I booked my accommodation in the city and I sent out a few emails to different organizations to see if anyone would be interested in talking to me. And then I basically just booked like a couple of historic tours and that was it. Well, most of the responses to my emails were negative. <laughs> like they were polite but they declined. However, I got one response, which was quite positive. And I was fairly surprised. I actually didn't think I would get anyone to talk to me. <laughs> so that particular interview was part of like a different thing. It's a, a science research project, but it was supposed to be like a, a nudge or a prod or something that would direct me into a particular direction. So I went to Hobart for two basic reasons. One was this research thing, and then the other one was this, except that I wasn't really sure what this was going to be. So I get into town on the Tuesday, Tuesday the 15th, and I do a little bit of driving around. The city is really difficult to park in, and the accommodation that I had did not have off street parking. So I could only park somewhere for about two hours at a time, unless it was like overnight. So after 6 p.m., uh, I didn't have to pay for parking and I didn't have to move my car. But before then, I basically had to be quite nomadic throughout the day, which was sort of good because it prodded me to go out and do things instead of just chilling in the accommodation. So I didn't really spend much time in the, uh, the little cottage that I had booked, but, um, it was right in the middle of town. And so if I could leave my car somewhere, then I would go and walk. So probably at around 5 PM, I walk down to the main thoroughfare of town. Now the interview that I had lined up was with one of the scientific agencies, which is down near the foreshore. So I was doing some like location filming, that kind of stuff. I had my uh, more portable camera with me. I'm walking through town and it's getting dark already because obviously this is the middle of winter and the sun starts setting at like four o'clock in the afternoon because we're way south. It's the dead of winter and this is a very relevant point. So when I was a practicing pagan, uh, one of the main celebrations of the year was the midwinter solstice. It was the second most important event on the calendar after Halloween. And at some point I probably will do a video on what Halloween actually represents because yeah, you should not be sending your kids out. <laughs> the thing is, uh, Tasmania is an interesting place. It has an extremely dark history. There was a lot of violence and it was originally uh, colonized as a penal colony. If you want to get some idea of what Tasmania's early European history was like, you should watch the film The Nightingale. Uh, I don't actually recommend watching it because it's extremely violent and a lot of people ended up leaving the cinema 
because it was just too disturbing. But it's very accurate. So Tasmania as a punishment for um, people who had broken the law in England, Tasmania was pretty much the worst place that you could be sent to. It was considered hell on earth. And this place does have a very strong reputation for hauntings. If you haven't already seen it, I have done a video on what ghosts actually are. And uh, I will link that in the description box for you because they are not human. But these disembodied spirits that tend to hang out in places where there was a very violent history, they go there because of the residual trauma. These things feed off fear and violence and sadness. And that is a lot of places in Tasmania. So there's that aspect to the island, but the other aspect is that it's fairly far south. The next major piece of land is Antarctica. So Hobart is a city which has a lot of Antarctic research facilities. Uh, it's one of the main industries that they do there. So it's the darkest place in Australia and it's also got one of the bloodiest histories in Australia. So as you can imagine, I'm walking through town and it's basically the time of day when people are finishing up work, but it's already becoming really, really dark. And so I'm getting a lot of what you might call night shots. And there's all of these buildings as I'm walking through that are lit up red. And I'm like, am I in the wrong part of town? <laughs> this used to be a good part of town. What happened? <laughs> no. I am not in the wrong part of town. The whole town has been lit up red for this festival, which I actually thought was the week after. Not only did I think it was the week after, I actually thought it was in a different town because normally it's held in the Huon Valley, which is like 40 kilometers away. So I'm actually not expecting to catch this particular festival. And I will put a couple of photos from their Instagram account. Now the festival is called Dark Mofo. And just in case you're wondering, yes, the word mofo means exactly what it means in Australia as it does in America. But as you can see, it's essentially Australia's version of Burning Man. They do things like the Wicker Man, which in the past was actually a ritual of human sacrifice. And they also burn other effigies, including um, angels. So the festival is actually kicking off in the middle of town, which I didn't realize. And as I'm walking through, everyone's kind of getting into the spirit of it and promoting this festival. So all of the buildings are lit up red and there's a whole bunch of shop fronts, which I will show you here, uh, where you've got all these basically satanic displays like this mannequin and all of these upside down crosses. So I keep walking and as I'm walking, I get to the other side of the harbor and that's where they've set up the crosses. They've got three gigantic luminous crosses on their side. Now the interview that I had lined up uh, for the science project, that guy was very informative and so I can see why uh, God kind of sent me the right people at the right time. Uh, there was more than one occasion when that happened. But the chap that I ended up talking to the next morning in the interview uh, afterwards, he's like, yeah, they had those crosses up in, I think, 2019 and they were upside down and it caused a big stir. So this year they're on their side and obviously like 2020, they didn't have the festival. <laughs> so I get all of this footage on the first night that I'm there and then I do my interview the next morning. And while I'm waiting for the interview to start, I'm sort of filming the crosses from across the harbor, <laughs> glowing red. They are very similar to a music video by The Weeknd. 
blasphemy and Satanism is actually really mainstream and really popular culture now. But yeah, in that music video, he like wanders around the house dragging this red glowing cross and then using it to smash everything. So the other things that I found out during that interview was that it would be kicking off that night on Wednesday the 16th and that you didn't have to book. I had totally assumed that if I wanted to go to this particular festival that I had to book ahead and because I hadn't done that I was like well I can't go but no it was actually you couldn't book ahead you had to pay at the door so they were only taking people as they turned up and the other thing that he told me about which was very interesting and I actually did catch it so this was this was something that you did have to book in for um, and it was already sold out so I wasn't able to go to this particular thing it was an art piece called Memorial and again it had kind of sparked a little bit of controversy in the news when I looked it up afterwards uh, I actually couldn't find out what time it was on when I had a look on the website it just said between 6 p.m. and 8 p.m. So that could be like any time during that time. It was a fireworks display over the river, uh, except that these were not ordinary fireworks. What they had done was they had asked volunteers to donate the cremated remains of their dead relatives. And then they stuffed the ashes into a firework and then they exploded it over the river. So if I had have been there like a day later I would have missed it and as it was I had no idea when it was on and I was eating inside in the hall and then I just happened to be outside within the 10 minutes of the one firework actually going off and because it was only one firework I did not manage to get it on film because I wasn't expecting when it would go off. As far as like exploding your dead relatives go, it was quite tasteful. So you might be wondering what this is all about. Like, what is the point of this festival? Well, it's an arts festival. And when I studied art, it was always like pushing the boundaries of what was socially acceptable, what was moral. Yeah, art is always considered to be like avant-garde. Uh, which basically means like sticking your finger up to authority and uh, the biggest authority that you can find is God. So there is a lot of art out there which sticks up the middle finger to God all the time. The Dark Mofo Festival is actually run by a private organization that has a permanent gallery in Hobart it's called Mona, which stands for the Museum of Old and New Art. It's a really interesting facility. I've been there twice. But the themes of this particular art gallery slash museum is sex and death. So they have a whole bunch of Egyptian artifacts and they also have Egyptian mummies. They have an entire wall like corridor that is lined with plaster casts of vaginas. But there's a lot of stuff in there that's quite macabre. It's like this blend of the perverted and the macabre. And they also produce their own alcohol. So it's very much a drinking spot. Like as soon as you get into the gallery, the first thing that you come to is the bar. And the building itself is really interesting. It's essentially like an underground bunker they carved out a limestone cliff and then built like this subterranean uh, multi-level complex. It's a bit like going into a Bond villain's lair. <laughs> so the branding of Mona is uh, like a plus symbol and a time symbol. So it's two crosses. One is an X and one is the T. And the X represents sex and the T represents death. So when they hold the festival of Dark Mofo, 
The themes for that are exactly the same, sex and death. So everywhere around the city were all of these crosses. A lot of them were upside down. And I actually stumbled across a church that had been branded for the festival. So later on that evening, I am lining up to get into uh, what's called the feast. So the first thing that they do is they hold a feast. And it's basically like a, a who's who of the gourmet of Tasmania. So it's very nice. It's very good food. But the whole hall is decked out like, I don't know, uh, a Catholic mass. And later on, when I had a look at their Instagram page, they had this particular photo of the hall and the caption underneath it said, give us this Eve our nightly bread. I mean, they're not even really concealing the fact that what they're doing is a pagan satanic ritual. They, they explicitly say that what they're doing is a pagan ritual. But you'll also see that all of it, all of it is targeting Christianity. All of it is perverting Christ. So the whole festival is a black mass and it was crammed with families. Like when I was standing in line, the amount of prams and toddlers was probably like more than the adults. There were more children there than there were adults, which I found totally, totally shocking. Like, there, there would have been hundreds of people there, if not thousands. So one of the funny things that happened was while I was lining up, um, I ended up talking to the people who were in front of me and um, they actually invited me to hang out with them. So again, I think God kind of put me in touch with the right people in the right place at the right time because uh, I definitely had protection. <laughs> and not only that, but because I was kind of like, I didn't have plans. I hadn't planned any of this. So I just kind of followed this group of people where they went and what they saw. And it happened to be all of the things that I needed to see at the time that they were happening, which was very interesting. <laughs> so there was the black mass <laughs> at the feast. And then we moved to another venue. And this venue was called X Cathedra. And while the, uh, the festival hall, the feast hall was all about death, X Cathedra was all about sex. So this is where I saw the performance artist known as Pope Alice. Thank you. 
Hope Alice is some kind of alien. And I had a look on the performance artists website, uh, which was very interesting. There was this um, brief little paragraph. Um, it, it didn't really have links to go anywhere, but it was all about uh, porn. So I don't know if this performance artist produces porn or if they star in porn or what the story is there. Um, but this particular type of porn was incest. And it's interesting how the alien phenomena is generally kind of associated with anal probes. I stumbled upon this particular article about a group of alien enthusiasts who have their own anal probes that they use for fun. <laughs> There's a couple of really good Christian documentaries on the alien phenomena. One is called Alien Intrusions and the other one is called Higher Entities. And I will link those in the description box below so you can check them out if you really want to. But essentially, what a lot of the alien researchers have come to believe about this phenomena is that they're not extraterrestrial. They're not from a different place. They've always been here. They just present themselves in various different ways. So in the past where you might have seen like goblins or fairies or other kinds of like cryptoids, these days they manifest as aliens and it's all about technology and coming from another planet. But even that story changes because back in like the 1950s, the alien visitations, they would claim to come from places like Mars. And then our own scientific exploration basically meant that we knew that that was false. And so the story changed. They changed where it was that they were coming from. And so these days they come from like the Pleiades or they come from Orion or some very distant galaxy and star system. But the thing about the alien phenomenon, which is very interesting, is that it doesn't usually affect born again Christians. And for people who do experience uh, abduction type scenarios, if they actually call on the name of Jesus, then the abduction stops. And why would an extraterrestrial being be afraid of a dead religious character? Basically the reason for that is that they are not from another planet, they are fallen entities. And so in all likelihood, this is just another type of demonic deception. And it could be the maneuver that they're going to implement in the end times. But one of the other really strange things going on at the moment is the amount of government disclosure. They're actually releasing all of these reports saying, yeah, we don't know where this comes from. We don't have an explanation for it. It could actually be extraterrestrial. But yeah, as I was saying before, the, um, the researchers who are interested in alien phenomena, they've come to the conclusion, generally speaking, that it's interdimensional, not extraterrestrial. Because a lot of these sightings and a lot of these encounters, they don't obey any laws of physics. They're not affected by physical reality. And that's essentially what the New Age also believes. They believe that these are interdimensional beings, but they think of them as enlightened spirit guides, which again has changed over the years because people that I knew who were, you know, practicing mediumship and that kind of thing, they were an older crowd. And when they first started channeling, they were channeling like essentially human characters. They would either be like a, a Native American shaman or a Tibetan monk or something like that, that had reached enlightenment and then passed on. And now they're coming to talk to you and give you the keys of enlightenment. But in recent decades, that's changed. It's less about a human character and more about these 
supposed star beings. And then you get all of this stuff about, you know, how we're going to ascend, how we're going to reach enlightenment. And it's all about hybridizing the species. Well, if you read the Bible, they've already tried that. They tried that back in Genesis chapter six. And the product of that hybridization was called the Nephilim. And the Nephilim were completely unredeemable. They were an abomination. They were not a creation of God. And so they could not go to heaven. So it's interesting that there's all of these celebrations about alien life forms, and they seem to be paired up with Satanism. And I thought it was very interesting that the character is called Pope Alice, because the actual Pope is very pro alien. Francis has famously said that he would baptize an alien if one showed up. But the Vatican has also released statements to say that, you know, if, if aliens turned up, they might not necessarily need redemption, that they might actually be sinless, and that perhaps we should be listening to them instead of trying to convert them. The Vatican has some very strange interests in astronomy. Uh, so the Jesuit order are the astronomers of the Vatican. And the Vatican has a facility on the top of Mount Graham, which I think is in Arizona. It's in the US. And at this particular facility, they coordinate with the Max Planck Institute to research the heavens. And for some reason, they decided to call the binocular device Lucifer. So they named their telescope Lucifer. And then people were like, what? And then they were like, oh, we'll rename it. But there are some very strange reports, um, which again are in these particular documentaries, um, especially higher entities. If you watch higher entities, they actually interview people who have liaised with government agencies, which are liaising with entities. That probably sounds extremely strange and it is extremely strange. But if you think of all of the different uh, maneuvers that are currently going on in the world where the Catholic church is talking about unity, you know, the Pope wants everyone to get along, whether they're Jewish or Muslim or Buddhist. So that's kind of like a one world religion that he's pushing. And uh, most Catholics are really uncomfortable with that. But because of the way that the Catholic Church is set up, they can't really say anything because they have essentially appointed a man as the Vicar of Christ. And if you don't really know what Vicar of Christ means, uh, the word Vicar comes from the Latin root word vicarious. And that is what the Pope claims to be. He claims to be Christ on earth. He is the vicarious Christ, or as some people have pointed out, the Antichrist. Like technically that's what that means. <laughs> And that kind of claim for a human being is blasphemy. That was one of the things that they accused Jesus of. And one of the other things that they accused Jesus of, which is also blasphemy, is having the authority to forgive sins. So Jesus has the authority to forgive sins because he is God, but the Pope does not. So certain things are being positioned into place in order to kind of set up an alien antichrist 
like the, the coming Messiah will be some sort of alien savior. We have ideas like this in science as well, the theory of panspermia. And so the theory of panspermia means that some alien could just rock up one day and say, oh, hey, I'm your space daddy. <laughs> Essentially what happened in Guardians of the Galaxy. And you might think, you know, why would this be appealing to people? Like, why would they fall for this? Well, it depends what kind of goodies an alien overlord turns up with. Because as I mentioned, in Genesis chapter 6, they uh, talked about how the sons of God, the Benai Elohim, also known as angels, they came down to earth, they were part of the watchers, and they saw the daughters of men, and they thought that they were pretty hot, and defying God, they interbred. So there are very good theories out there which would suggest that the final deception, the final antichrist maneuver is an alien that comes to Earth and says, I can fix your DNA problems. One of the challenges for the human race at this point in time is genetic entropy. Because of our fallen state, because of the consequences of sin, we were, we were awesome at one point in time. Like if you read the genealogy of the early part of Genesis, people lived till almost a thousand years old. So genetics were really robust back in the day and then sin was introduced and it brought with it death and decay. So imagine that some benevolent um, alien overlord that cannot be killed because that's one of the parts of the prophecy is that the Antichrist will survive death. Let's just have a read through of Revelation chapter 13 to get an outline of exactly how this is going to go down. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs, so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He calls us all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. 
Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. So one of the theories about the mark of the beast is that essentially it's going to be changing people's DNA. So kind of like transhumanism. And it's changing people to the point where they are no longer human. People have been messing around with the concept of genetic hybridization for a long time. There was this fascination not that long ago with an immortal jellyfish and trying to figure out ways to splice human genome with jellyfish genome so that we never die. And why is this so appealing to people? Why is this kind of uh, part of the war with God? Well, essentially, if you never die, then you never have to reckon with God. And it literally says in Revelation that people will want to die and they won't be able to. So if the false messiah, the antichrist turns up and they have this false prophet in like the form of the Pope, who's like, Hey, this is our intergal intergalactic savior. If something like that turns up on our doorstep and we're told, you know what, you can live forever. You don't have to get old and die. People are going to be very, very interested in that. And people would potentially worship that entity as a God. And what is the temple of God these days if it's not humans? And it also says later on in Revelation that if anyone takes this particular mark of the beast, they cannot be redeemed. They are no longer human. So that's why one of the first warnings that we get from Jesus during the Olivet Discourse is basically to say, don't let anyone deceive you. And in Matthew chapter seven, he also talks about deception as one of the biggest problems. And he specifically says that deception will be within the church. So there's deception coming from within the church, but there's also deception coming from the culture. I mean, judging by how many people were at this particular satanic black mass on Wednesday night, it's quite obvious that people are very comfortable with this sort of stuff. They don't really know what it is that they're looking at. They think it's just art when the reality is that they're actually taking part in a gigantic ritual. There is so much of popular culture, which is directed towards deceiving people. When I was 18 years old, I was going to church every week. I was singing in the church choir. I even was contemplating the idea of becoming a nun. And my mother bought me the first Harry Potter book because she figured I would like it. And I did. Now it's important to say that even though mass media and popular culture is hugely influential, I am still responsible for my choices and decisions. And so is everyone else. However, popular culture has definitely been glamorizing witchcraft for a long time. One of the things that I found hugely influential was the movie practical magic. Things like books and movies and TV, they promote things which are actually abominations to God. And most of us put up with it readily enough. Why are people so blase about this stuff? Well, it's kind of the same thing when you have an abusive relationship. They don't start the relationship by slapping you across the face or punching you in the gut that comes years later. 
what actually happens with abusive relationships is they push against your boundaries. They push you outside of your comfort zone to see whether they can. If you accept it, if you allow them to cross those lines, then they keep doing it. They keep taking another step, another step, another step until they have trampled all over you. Another way that I have heard Christians uh, talk about this particular subject is the frog in the pot of water. So the theory goes, and I'm hoping it's theory and not based on any kind of um, practical experiment, but the theory goes that if you throw a frog into a pot of boiling water, it will immediately jump out because ouch, that hurts. However, if you put a frog in a pot of cool water, set it on the stove and then gradually warm it up until the frog is cooked, then the frog doesn't necessarily jump out because it hasn't noticed that it's boiling to death. It's all about gradual change, gradual shifts in the culture. And you look at something like the latest, I think it's Disney film Cruella. In the past, when you had things like fairy tales, you would have the good guy and the bad guy. And now you have the bad guy who is the good guy. Movies like Maleficent and Cruella, who were the homicidal maniacs in the original films. They're now the main characters and you're supposed to be empathizing with them. And it's kind of the same thing that I came across with like Harry Potter. So when I was first reading it, there were these Christian groups who were like, this is going to give people the wrong impression about witchcraft. And I was like, that's absurd. I was totally in the naysayer group. I was like, that'll never happen. And then 15 years later, I'm a witch. Do I think that JK Rowling is a bad person? No, I just think that she's basically a product of the culture. So as all of the cultural shifts take place, we kind of need to be aware of it. We need to understand what the agenda is, how the chess pieces are moving into place and how to avoid the pitfalls, how to avoid being deceived because apparently this is going to be so overwhelmingly amazing that if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. And I gotta say, an immortal alien, that, that would do it. And I know that in literature and pro popular culture, when I was working in the libraries, it went from the whole witchcraft, uh, Harry Potter phase into the vampire, werewolf, immortal phase. And then it shifted into the fallen angel phase. And that was a whole genre of teen romance. So it's always being romanticized. It's always being pushed as like, a good thing. This is something that you want. This is something that you desire. Just look at how many people are signing up to get anally probed. One of the biggest problems that I often see in popular culture is that the good side is either it's this thing of like, you're a human, but you have the power within you all the time, or there's like the superhero, demigod kind of figure who saves everyone or evil is so powerful that it cannot be overcome. At no point in most movies and popular culture does anyone ever attribute any power and authority to God. It is conspicuously lacking in popular culture. Personally, I would like to see a shift away from that. Because in my experience, the other side is piss weak. <laughs> like it's, it's pathetic. If you've ever seen the Holy Spirit in action, then you are not afraid of any of these entities or creatures whatsoever, because they are on a very short leash. They are only allowed to do whatever you give them permission to do. And sin 
is legal grounds for them. So that's why, you know, uh, being delivered, being born again is supposed to free you from sin is because that's part of it. And if people don't believe that being born again frees you from sin, then they're essentially denying the power of God. God is able to deliver you from entities and he is able to deliver you from the things that possess you, whether that's addictions or certain compulsions that you might have. And if you're willing to disassociate from darkness, then God steps in. So yeah, don't be afraid of any of the things that might confront you over the next few years and don't get sucked into them. Remember that your first love is God. Remember what is most important and keep your prayer life going. So even when people call you stupid or backwards or ridiculous, don't worry about it. All right, guys, hopefully that was helpful. Let me know in the comments uh, if you have your own encounters, like whether it's some strange art show that you've been to, <laughs> maybe you've accidentally gone to a satanic festival, <laughs> or if you have your own theories about aliens and different types of deception out there, I'm always interested to hear it. In the meantime, take care and I will see you next time. Bye.